There you go. Okay, perfect. First of all, I want to thank everyone, uh, and especially Deb and Kathy, for this incredible opportunity to be here at y'all's 50th anniversary of the Texas Art Institute School of Perfusion. It is certainly a uh, an icon of, uh, of, of education in our profession. It's where our profession, from a modern perspective, I think began, of course, with the founder, Charlie Reed. I understand that Charlie's son is somewhere in this audience. There's somebody that kind of looks like him, but, uh, but uh, uh, maybe a little, little older, um, not, as, not, as, not as crazy, maybe not as wild, uh, but, uh, but, but certainly here. And it's just, it's just a tremendous honor. And I appreciate you guys being here, the senior students, uh, the junior students too. Um, you get your chance next year and you guys are, you know, be welcome to participate if you'd like to, uh, but just being here is incredible. So thank you for very much for the opportunity. So my talk, I'm going to start my little timer and I'm actually going to let it only go for 15 minutes because if I don't, I talk too much and you'll, you'll all find that out about me. So uh, my talk is on ECMO overview, why, how, and outcomes. Now, in reality, I could probably talk on this subject for 15 days and still not cover a portion of it. It's just such a complex issue. Uh, so why do we do it? Well, we use it for circulatory support where we have circulatory collapse, cardiogenic shock, MI, PE, post-cardiotomy failure, failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass, you know, obviously. And uh, of course, we use it for pulmonary failure, ARDS, status asthmaticus, any cause of pulmonary failure could be pre-transplant support. There's just so many different reasons we do it. But at the end of the day, we either need circulatory support or we need circulatory and pulmonary support or we just need pulmonary support. That's kind of the way this whole thing works. So how do we do it? Well, you have VA, so we can do veno-arterial ECMO, right? We can do veno-venous ECMO. We can do exotic cannulations where you have VA-V, veno-arterial to venous. We can have venous, venous to arterial. And for those of you who don't know, friend of Tammy's and mine, uh, Tammy, I think you heard from Tammy next, maybe you're, or second after me, uh, John Ingram uh, pointed this out to me. And I think intuitively we knew it, but he pointed it out. Where the dash is, is where the oxygenator goes. So when you're describing ECMO, it's really good to know what are we doing? Do we have two accesses, two returns? Do we have two different circuits? Do we have one access, two returns? And so where that dash goes tells you a lot. For example, in the VVVV, clearly two different circuits, two oxygenators. That's the one at the very bottom. We can have central cannulation. We can have peripheral cannulation. You can have combinations of those, combina of those cannulations. So really at the end of the day, there's all kinds of ways all kinds of places to put these tubes. Where you put them, however, is going to depend on what you're trying to accomplish and whether you accomplish it well or not. Here's just a diagram of all the available options. I won't go through them all, but you can see the ones on the far right of the screen being the butterfly technique. You have dual circuits and the ones on the left are different iterations of VVA, VAV and so forth. So you can review all of these at your leisure, but leave it to say, this is only a partial representation of all of the different things that you can do. Now, for the senior students, outcomes. Outcomes is a big deal. And I'm actually going to spend probably a little more time on that than anything else today. How many of you find six folks believe that when you go and you they give a consult, we're going to have to put this patient on ECMO, and we really think it may benefit your patient, that they tell with VA, it's 20%. If you think it's 20% is the what is normally consulted as the survivability. So keep in mind, this is survival, that the patient will survive. How many think it's 20%? If you think it's 20%, raise your hand, okay? How many think it's 40%? Okay, two hands. How many think it's 60%? Okay, and how many think it's 80%? Nobody, okay, good. 10 bucks each. Okay, VV ECMO. 
when you consult for that, the just average, how many people think that they tell the family, we think it's going to be about, a, and this is for any cause, not specific, so keep that in mind, 20%. 40%, 60%, and 80%, okay? So, very good. So, all of you get 20 bucks. Fantastic, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 20, 20, okay. I may need to borrow some money, Deb, Tammy, anybody, collection jar out there. They're smarter than I thought. This isn't going well. So, let's look at survival. Survival is such an important thing. And this is published survival. And it's very, very, um, I think, inconsistent at best and confusing, even to me, um, and in some ways concerning because this stuff gets published, people read it, and decisions are made about using ECMO in various circumstances that may or may not be a great choice. And so we have to look at the data, however, in order to understand. So in this one year outcomes with VV ECMO, and this is for COVID-19 published in the STS, um, we see here that the end number is relatively low, it's 30, um, all VV, BMIs were about 30, and I highlighted a couple of things, we can just look through some stuff. Um, days from intubation to ECMO cannulation were two, which is, really short and good because that's important. I think a, a key indicator, the longer you're on vent support with all the barotrauma, the less likely you're going to recover. And that's something that's very important. Do you have a recoverable disease? Putting people on ECMO, if you aren't going to transplant, you have to recover because you cannot stay on ECMO forever. Though there are some who have been on ECMO for a very long time and actually survived. So you have to remember there's outliers, but then there's also everyone else. Who's the outlier? No one really knows. Um, you look at their CRP and their PCTs and you can see uh, what those elevations or lack of really gross elevation is. Their PF ratio surprisingly were 80, which is low, but I've seen much, much lower before a decision to put a patient on ECMO existed. And you can see their peak pressures and their plat plateau pressures were 30 and 32. Again, those are high, but not unreasonably high. We've seen much higher numbers than that. Creatinines down in the middle bottom were relatively normal. Not a lot of renal failure in this population of patients. And let's just get right to the thing. They actually used 33%, so out of 10 of the patients, they used cytokine uh, hemoadsorption, which is like the cytosorb filter that you use for removing cytokines, so molecular adsorption recirculation technology. Um, those that survived ECMO, 93%. Those that survived to discharge, 90%. Duration of the ECMO was about 19 days. We've seen much, much longer than that on COVID patients. Um, and when you go to the final slide, their one year survival was 86.7%, 26 of the 30. That is absolutely remarkable. I worked here in Houston in a variety of different hospitals, including right here at the medical center with uh, patients that were on VV ECMO for COVID. And uh, none of the places that I worked, I saw this kind of survival but yet this is still published and published in the STS. So small end number, respect that, but how selective were they on their patient population? And that's something that always has to be asked. When you take a look at this other study here, monitoring cerebral oxygenation, and this in intrahospital transport, and this basically, this study was done to take, and this is published in the SIO 2022, again, COVID patients, and this was to determine whether or not the use of cerebral oximetry would be beneficial for taking a patient from hospital A and transporting them to hospital B. Um, but you, if you just look at it, the survival of these patients after ECMO support for VD was 50%. So now this was a smaller end number, it was 16, but I still believe that there's a definite difference between a 50% mortality 
And in 93, 86% mortality, 86.7, almost 87 at the end of one year. That is a very remarkable difference. And why is that? Well, I mean, we can look at the data and try to understand it. Hours on mechanical ventilation, uh, for those that survived were 83 hours, those that died were 98 hours. So they were on mechanical ventilation longer than the previous group. Their PF ratios, remember I showed you it was 80, now they're 70, 72, so for average 72 for the survivors and 68 for the non-survivors, though that was not quite statistically significant. Uh, their peak inspiratory pressures were a little bit higher. 34 was the average, 33.5 for the survivors, 35 for, the, uh, for those that, that died. You can see acute injury was higher in this population of patients as well. And obesity seemed to be a little bit higher also. So is this a patient selection issue? Is this a we waited longer and kept them on the vent and their disease is now irreversible. Is it that the previous study was that we put the patients on ECMO, maybe they really didn't need it. And I think that it's very important to understand that ECMO is in and of itself not good for us. If we take a normal, healthy person and put them on ECMO, it will hurt them. And there's a whole host of things that happen without getting into that, but you have to take that into consideration. Deciding to put somebody on ECMO can be the worst thing you can do for somebody if they cannot necessarily go on ECMO and still survive their disease. And how you make those determinations, man, I'll tell you what, it's a... I, I've been doing this for a long time and I can't answer that question. It is just clinical judgment and trying to do the right thing at the right time for the right person. And it's very difficult to do, but you will be confronted with this because I can assure all of you guys, all especially the senior students and, those, and the junior students in the back, ECMO, I believe will continue to advance as a therapeutic modality and the harsh reality, and you can, feel how you wish, but I'll tell you my perspective, is that there will never be enough perfusionists in the market to accommodate what is a seasonal and fluctuating volume of patients for a therapeutic modality. If you have enough perfusionists to cover every ECMO that could happen during a pandemic, you will have so many perfusionists when there's not that pandemic or there's not that high acuity, you will not know what to do with yourselves and it will be very bad for our market. On the other hand, if you just give it away and have zero control of it, then that can be very deleterious for our industry as well. We have to somehow find a balance between the management of a tool and a modality while at the same time being able to utilize people who are going to manage the technical component of it at the bedside hour by hour and then use us for rounds consulting and so forth. I think that's the only way it's going to survive and not exclude us, but other people may have different views about that and certainly I respect those, but that's what I think. Um, moving on from here, uh, we look at this uh, predicted, probably is this, no, this is, no, that's not it. I'm sorry, I went to a different, different study. So we look here, then we look at, <laughs> that was the 16. Then we look at this last study, so there's three studies. This is the next one, also in ASIO 2022. And this was done with a large end number, now almost 2000 patients. And if you look at their mortality in this particular study, it's pretty close to 50-50. And this, was the, this is their numbers, much larger end, but you can see we went from, and it's about 50-50, it's a little bit better of survival. Maybe it's 55, I can't really tell you what that percentage is, somebody could do the math on it. But keep in mind, we're going from a 93%, 87 to 93% survival to a 50% survival to a 
plus or minus 53% survival. So those are consistent, but there are lots of other studies out there, lots of them that show variation from 80% survival, 50% survival, 30% survival. Our data, which we're not quite complete in putting it all together to make sure that we are as accurate as possible, but from what, just just on a, 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 with a caveat that this is not ready to be necessarily disseminated, Tammy, we're somewhere around 15% survival with an N of 100. So we have an N of 100 and we had about a 15% survival. Um, and that's dismal. It was very discouraging. It was, and my experience again, coming to the med center and being some of the hospitals, excluding those patients that were able to be transplanted. But I'm talking about patients that recovered from their disease, left the hospital, having survived COVID, ECMO. My experience here, not necessarily at Texas Heart, but over at uh, some of the other institutions was that their outcomes were just as abysmal. So it's surprising to me and concerning to me when I see these extraordinarily high survivors. If I have five minutes left. And here in the RESP score, you can see your higher RESP score, you have a higher probability of survival, a lower RESP score, and you can get the RESP score online. It's very easy. And you can look at your patient, you can put in all the information. If you have a very low RESP score, you have a much higher probability of mortality. So, uh, but, uh, but again, I think it's a very good tool to use. It's been validated several times. There's been also people who have validated it and found that it really wasn't as accurate as they believe it to be. So again, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, consider all of the resources, look at the patient, make determinations. Generally speaking, very overweight patients don't do as well, but yet there are patients who had, there's a patient that was 18 years old, had a BMI of 79, and they published it, was on ECMO for three months. Yeah, 79. Can you believe that? That's three people. Um, they, they needed three ECMOs at one time, but that patient survived. And those are outliers. One never knows when that's going to happen. And so, but is that the norm? And really, no, predictably, it's, it's not. So, you know, you just don't know. Okay, test for you guys. This is for, this is the bonus round, and this is for the big money now, okay? This is for the big money. Um, there's no trick. So if you, I, I can't, can I, is there a mouse I can use on this? Um, does it work? Okay, good. So if you look here, yeah, okay. Uh, can you take this away? How do I make that go away? Just drag it. Uh, oh, you're doing it? Okay, I let go. Perfect. Okay. So this line right here is in the right femoral artery. This line here is in the right femoral vein. This line here is in the left femoral vein. And this line here is in the left femoral artery. So my question to the students, and you could just blurt it out, first one to blurt it out, uh, wins that round. What is this and where is it? Okay, you can't, it's not two at a time. So whoever spoke first, whoever spoke first, stand up, say what you gotta say. It's a reperfusion catheter in the, The SFA, superficial femoral artery. Very good. Okay, you won that round. Don't let me forget. Okay. Now, next question. Just blurt it out if you want. What do you notice about these two access lines? This is in the right femoral vein. This is in the left femoral vein. What do you notice about these two accesses? Anybody see it? Blurt, blurt it. Stand up, raise your hand, blurt it out. Color difference. Color difference. Very good. Okay. Now, for the final question on this round, where is this cannula? Where is the, where, what is this draining? It's in the femoral vein and it's red. This is in the femoral vein and it's blue. Why is it red? What's it draining? You moved. Nope. <laughs> Come on, 
You laughed. Somebody say it. Junior students, anybody got an idea? It's where? Near the RA? Okay, you're st stay a junior student, sorry. <laughs> Wrong answer. Anybody else? Okay, so any of the any of the experienced perfusionists, where is it? I'm sorry? That's a good thought, but no. That's a good thought though. You can join those guys back there, Sanjay. <laughs> back there. So it basically, so let's think about it. I'm gonna give you guys a chance. It's red, right? It's draining arterialized blood. It is in a vein. It, it's in the right femoral vein. It's kind of hard to get to the pulmonary vein from there. You can do it, but how would you get, wait, you're, you're getting there. Where is it? How did it get there? Transeptal approach. Is that what you were going to say? It's got to be a tandem. You are correct. Good job. It's a catheter that's punctured through this atrial septum into the left atrium to decompress the left side. Very good. That concludes my talk. Thank you all very much.